David Ryan, the co-host, who's going to introduce the speakers today. Hi, uh, today's first talk is entitled Global Change in the Earth's Atmosphere, Natural and Anthropogenic Factors, and the presenter is Dr. Judith Lean, who's a senior scientist for the Sun Earth Systems Research at the Naval Lab Research Laboratory in Washington, D.C. Her research focuses on the mechanisms, measurements, modeling, and forecasting of variations in the sun's radiative output at all wavelengths and responses to this variability of the Earth's global climate, middle atmosphere, and space climate and weather. She's the ideal person to give this talk for it's probably accurate to say that she's the predominant sun climate researcher in the world today. All climate models need to separate out the natural from anthropogenic factors driving climate change. And basically all of them use the solar variations with time derived and continually updated by Judith. To produce this record requires, as her research focus indicates, a knowledge of both how the sun works and what the climate system needs to know about its variability. She is one of the few people who can bridge this divide. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the American Geophysical Union. It's been my great fortune to work with her and even more to know her for the last 20 years. Judith, thanks for giving this talk and for all the work you've done to raise our knowledge in this vital area of climate change research. We are going to pass it over to Judith. Judith, you should now be the host of the meeting and be able to share your screen. Judith, you're muted right now, so just unmute yourself. Excuse us, guys, while we just figure out a technical difficulty. No. Just one more second, everybody. Sorry about this. This is Dan. Um, we're going to transfer over the, the volume and the mute now. Sorry for the inconvenience, everybody. Judith, I've just unmuted you. Can you, um, if you hear me, can yes, you? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Judith, okay. we should be able to speak now. We should be able to hear you. Okay. If I want? Yes. yes. Okay, you can hear me. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> so, hello, everyone. Um, as you um, just experienced, we, I have the dubious pleasure of the first person to do this by remote. And we did practice, I promise you, but we didn't get the muting quite right. So my name is Judith Lean. Uh, I work at the Naval Research Lab in Washington, DC, and I'm going to talk about global change in Earth's atmosphere, natural and anthropogenic factors. Now, David is an expert in everything to do with global change, but I'm going to talk about 
the natural variability, in particular the sun, because that's the um, area that I work on. And I've had the privilege of working with David on this topic for over 20 years, which doesn't seem long actually, but in retrospect, it's quite a long time. And David started working with me on this topic when it wasn't really popular um, because it's always been a controversial topic. So this is what I'm going to talk about in my 20 slides. First of all, I'm going to briefly show you how Earth's atmosphere is changing. There's some warming, there's a lot of warming, and that's what people expect from an anthropogenic influence, but there's some cooling, and then there's a bit more warming, and this gets people confused about what is causing the Earth, the climate of the atmosphere to change. Judith, just, just hold on one, one second. I, I'm trying to share your screen and it's, it's not um, letting me share your screen. So just one, one second. Do I need to press something? Um, Judith, you should be able to share your screen now. I've made you the host. Well, I have the screen. I'm showing the screen. Do I have to do something to share it? Extra to share it? Yeah, so you go to the window that says share and then the, the Zoom window. There we go. Um, and now you should be able to click on your presentation to start share. Okay, so can you see there it we now? Go. Yes, we Am can. Am I sharing it? Am I sharing yes. it? Yes. Okay, okay, Great. well, Thank people are giving me the feedback when I do something wrong. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start by showing how Earth's atmosphere is changing, not just the surface, but also in the stratosphere where ozone has been decreasing, but it's partially recovering, recovering. Because these changes are happening in the atmosphere, we need to know why they're changing. And there are multiple reasons, including human activity, but also volcanic eruptions, natural variability, such as due to the El Nino oscillation and also solar activity. So I'm going to spend maybe half the talk uh, discussing why the atmosphere is changing and the collaboration that David and I have had for 20 years has been that David um, designs experiments um, using the various GIS climate models to study the impacts of solar variability. And I, for my part, analyze the observations as well as uh, model the changing irradiance uh, that David inputs to the model. So I'm going to conclude the talk uh, by talking about future changes. And this is both a speculation of what we can expect in the future from both natural and anthropogenic influences, but also identifying areas where the observations perhaps disagree with the model. So that's area of future work. So here is, here is a summary of how the atmosphere is changing. Uh, at the bottom is the greenhouse gas concentration, which has been going up. Then the global surface temperature, which you can see in pink from 1980 to 2010, has been going up a bit, but not so much in the last decade. And this has, of course, caused quite a bit of consternation amongst people who think, um, including the public, who think that if we have an anthropogenic influence, it is going to have a monotonic effect on our temperature. In other words, it will just keep going up. Furthermore, at 20 kilometers, you can see the observations of global temperature from space-based instruments show that there's been actually a cooling. Now, 20 kilometers isn't that high above the surface. And some people argue that, wow, the atmosphere is cooling. That means we don't have global warming. I'm going to show you that these two uh, regions of the atmosphere, in fact, are affected by anthropogenic influences but in different ways and that the sun and volcanic activity also influence them. And then also in the middle atmosphere we have the ozone layer which is uh, a concern too in terms of environmental impacts because it pr protects us from solar radiation. You can see the ozone has been decreasing and this caused um, the Montreal Protocol to be implemented and as a result ozone has started increasing. But is that the only reason ozone is increasing? Uh, I'm going to talk about that as well. So that's how the atmosphere has been changing in recent
decades increased dramatically from 1905 to 1945. And this is this um, pattern here shows you where the increases primarily were, but it increased again uh, from 1955 to 2003. The pattern of warming is somewhat different and there was this cooling in the middle. So one of the debates, of course, is how much of this is due to the sun and how much is due to anthropogenic activity. Over the much longer time scale of the past thousand years, we know that the temperature uh, on Earth has increased much more rapidly than, than, than we've seen. And perhaps this is also true throughout the Holocene. So the question is, why are these changes happening and can we understand them? It's important, of course, to start with the sun because the sun is the source of energy for the Earth. Uh, the sun is a variable middle-aged star. It provides energy to the Earth in the form primarily of visible photons. And the Earth reflects that energy, but it also, these photons also heat the Earth, which then radiates to space. So the Earth and the sun are like two bodies in, in the cosmos. If the sun's a radiance, if these visible photons were really constant, then that would simplify things quite a bit because we would only be concerned about the Earth and what affects it, but that's not the case. The energy budget of the Earth is very complicated and the temperature, the surface temperature is really the balance achieved when uh, this energy balance comes to equilibrium and part of that is the incoming energy from the sun. But it doesn't just heat the Earth's surface and that's that. It actually, as it comes in, it's absorbed by the atmosphere. The atmosphere also reflects some of it. It creates things like the ozone, which then absorbs a bit more. It heats the Earth's surface, which then, as I said, radiates back to space. So all this incoming and outgoing energy, these photons at different wavelengths, um, are absorbed, reflected and, reflected and refracted by the Earth's atmosphere. So it's a very difficult problem, but the start of it is the sun. So there are many causes of global change to summarize. Uh, solar variability and volcanic eruptions are natural forces. And I'm going to talk more about, about these. But there are anthropogenic gases, not just uh, in the form of greenhouse gases, but, but also due to um, aerosols from industrial activity. There are land cover changes and there are internal oscillations such as the El Nino Southern Oscillation, the North Atlantic Oscillation and the QBO, quasi-biennial oscillation. The reason I'm pointing all these out is because all of these things affect the atmosphere and the surface temperature simultaneously. The solar signal has to be extracted from these, from these different influences or to put it another way, you can't just try and extract one influence on the earth, on the terrestrial system, without paying attention to the other things. So that's why what I'll be showing you going forward uh, are um, influences not just of the sun, but responses due to these other things as well. The starting point, as I said, is solar irradiance. And we began to have a record, a direct record of the sun's irradiance starting in about 1978. And this is a composite record shown here from uh, multiple space-based measurements launched by NASA. And it's an amazing record. It's a time series that has a lot of variability. Now you might think this is a very noisy time series, but it's not. All these dips, for example, occur when there are big sunspots on the sun's disk, which decrease the irradiance. There's an, a solar cycle that you can see here, a dominant solar cycle. And that's because these bright regions called faculae cause the irradiance to increase. The main thing to notice is that there's a change of, a, of about one watt per meter squared in the incoming energy from the sun. That's a tenth of a percent. People think a tenth of a percent, that's nothing. That's, that's not going to affect anything. But the energy from the sun is so great and Jim Hansen and colleagues at Geese wrote a paper on this in 1979, that the energy itself in just a tenth of a percent is a significant amount of forcing. The time series here uh, that you see in orange of the observations or of the actual irradiance changes is a result of this facular brightening and sunspot darkening, two different time series, two different effects, each of which actually tracks the sunspot numbers. Now, until we had this record, 
a lot of um, climate research and paleo climate research uh, consisted of using the sunspot number to, for correlations or for things like that. But now that we have this record, we can start to study the process through climate models, which is why David and the GIST climate models have been you know, very important in understanding the processes. The processes by which the sun affects climate are multiple and complicated. It's not just that the irradiance increases and every wavelength increases. Well, that's true, it does, but, it, but as you can see here, different parts of the solar spectrum, which is shown here by blue as the black body curve, peaking in the visible, different parts, different wavelengths change in different amounts as the solar activity changes. So the total solar irradiance is the integral of all these changes, but the ultraviolet wavelengths change more, for example. Further complicating the problem of understanding the effects of this changing spectrum on the Earth is that this white curve here shows you that the atmosphere absorbs different amounts of irradiance, preferentially at different wavelengths. So for example, most of the, radi most of the radiation below 300 nanometers is absorbed in the atmosphere and it creates the ozone layer. So if we didn't have the sun, we wouldn't have the ozone layer. So it's a complicated uh, task. And one way of looking at the effect um, of the sun on climate is a statistical uh, breakdown of the surface temperature record that I showed you earlier. And that's shown here in this white curve. This is the global surface temperature observations. In this case, from the um, Hadley group, the orange curve is a model. There's a statistical, oops, my fault, a statistical model that simply combines the effects of the El Nino oscillation, shown here in purple, volcanic eruptions, the solar activity cycle, in other words, the irradiance, the total solar irradiance, and greenhouse gases. And this is something that David and I worked on, um, it, goodness, about 10 years ago now, you can see in this GRL paper. The, um, what you can see in a very simple way is if we have a big El Nino, like this super um, so um, in the late 1900s, 1990s, the temperature increases. But if we have an ENSO like the one here, at the same time as we have a volcanic eruption, then it's sort of muted in the global surface temperature record. When we come to this present plateau here that people call the hiatus, there's nothing hiatus about it at all. All that simply happened was the greenhouse gases kept warming the planet. So nothing stopped or abated in terms of the anthropogenic effect, but there was a tendency of the El Nino oscillation to be in a La Nina phase. Coupled with that declining solar irradiance, it was enough to mute this warming here. And David, I talked about this in these papers. So simplistically, in a statistical sense, you actually can detect a solar signal in the temperature record. And this has been done now by a number of people a number of times, uh, including the regional patterns. And what you can see here is that the El Nino, volcanic activity, anthropogenic influences, and the solar cycle all have their own distinct regional pattern. And they're not the same by any means. So pulling out the solar signal regionally and globally means understanding all these other signals as well. Of course, a statistical analysis is um, a simplistic way of doing this, and you would like to do it better with climate models. Um, and so here I'm showing you how that happened in the last IPCC over the longer term. The model that I showed you in orange, shown here now over the last 100, more than 100 years, is a combination of volcanic activity in blue, the El Nino Southern Oscillation in purple, a modest solar, a solar cycle superimposed on a very modest long-term trend, which is our current understanding of the amplitude of the long-term solar irradiance changes, and a significant increase due to greenhouse gases. So the empirical model says that, or suggests that this is what's happening. The community climate model, which is a physical model from NCAR, which is one of the IPCC models, doesn't necessarily reproduce that time series seen white that is observed as well as one might like. And if you break down the components of the variability going into this model, you find that 
it doesn't represent the phasing of the El Nino Southern Oscillation, even though this particular model is one of the best um, climate models at reproducing ENSO light variability. The other thing you can see is that it overestimates the volcanic contribution. See this um, big decrease here, much bigger than you detect statistically. It underestimates the solar cycle and it produces a lot more greenhouse warming. You, ideally, you would like these two images or these two graphs to converge because that would say that we had uh, a good coherent understanding. Of course, there are arguments about um, cross-correlation of the various predictors of the, of the statistical model. So both, there are issues with both approaches. So one of the things that David did was to design for the GIST Model 3 some, a series of simulations to try and look at how this particular model simulates these different factors. Now the GIST Model 3 extends up to 85 kilometers and it has parameterized ozone. So it's useful to look not just at the surface, which I'm showing here, but also at the, the, the middle atmosphere, which I'll show you um, later few more slides to come. But you can see in particular that the agreement, for example, of the solar activity response or the response of surface temperatures to solar activity in the empirical model versus in the physical climate model has some similarities like the warming over the um, Eura Eurasian region, but it's not, you wouldn't really say they're identical by any means. They do both show inhomogeneity inhomogeneities, which is a result of the dynamical responses to the radiative forces. When you look at the volcanic uh, um, signal in the model, which is on the right versus in the empirical observation on the left, again, you can see similarities in that there are uh, regions of warming and cooling indicative of dynamical motions in both, but they're not necessarily identical by any means, and nor are the anthropogenic, the patterns of the anthropogenic effect. So that's at the surface. And when I started showing these um, simulations or these, these statistical patterns, um, I got a lot of pushback from the climate modelers who basically said, no, our climate models are right. And you know, this is what we see. David, of course, is known and loved for never actually believing entirely what the climate models say. And so we came to the sort of consensus that it would be really good for these two things to converge rather than to say one's right and the other isn't. Now, um, just to enforce that or just to demonstrate that the empirical model actually is doing something meaningful in pulling out the uh, response of surface temperature or of the, the surface to the sun, this is the synopsis or a, a, a compilation of paleo sun climate uh, relationships. One of the areas where the sun's influence on climate is most significant and reported in many publications is in the paleo arena. There'll often be a paper saying, you know, any one of these um, topics here, for example, warming in Beijing, drought in equatorial East Africa, weakening of the trade winds. These are published as long-term correlations between solar indices and climate indices. What you can see when you put them on this pattern of the, of the recent um, surface temperature maps, they actually agree very well. Uh, they're quite consistent. The other thing that you can see is that a lot of the sun climate relationships involve the hydrological cycle, like rainfall, for example, drought. And that's because um, and that's, that's something that the model can look really closely at. It's more complicated than understanding the temperatures. So that is a, a synopsis of the paleo signals that uh, connect the sun and climate. One thing to, to point out that this points out is even though you might see a paper or a, a result saying, for example, drought in equatorial East Africa related to the sun, that doesn't mean that the entire um, surface is is responding the same way as equatorial East Africa. In other words, significant local changes do not imply global changes of equal magnitude. And that's important to remember because that then gets back to putting the sun's role in perspective with respect to greenhouse gases. So moving up now into the higher into the stratosphere, this is the temperature at 19 kilometers, which as I said, isn't very high above the surface. And here is the global total ozone. 
These both represent a layer in the atmosphere where the temperature is cooler than at the surface. And the temperature here is, the global temperature is decreasing, as you can see, at the same time that the surface temperature was warming. The same things, the volcanic um, aerosols, the quasi biennial oscillation, in other words, an internal oscillation, the solar cycle and anthropogenic gases can all be put together to explain this time series quite well, but they're different. The time series of the individual diff influences are different than for the surface. So for example, volcanic aerosols warm the atmosphere at 20 kilometers, whereas they cool it at the surface. The solar cycle now, instead of being a tenth of a degree or less from the minimum to the maximum of the cycle, is now three tenths of a degree. The greenhouse gases are cooling the atmosphere, whereas they warm the surface. And the chlorofluorocarbons are also now uh, playing a role. And that's because the chlorofluorocarbons uh, affect ozone and ozone uh, affects temperature. When we move to ozone, you can see the time series here, although ozone and temperature are related, they're by no, the time series of their global changes are by no, by no means identical. And the same influences, for example, volcanic aerosols, decrease ozone, but increase temperature. And this is where the model can really, really help in trying to understand the causes of these different um, factors. So here are the, the GIST Model 3 simulations. Oops, sorry of um, the temperature in the, the lower stratosphere compared with the statistical observations. Uh, you can see that um, the solar activity component now is actually looking pretty good. In other words, the model is doing a decent job, or should I say the empirical observations are doing a decent job of identifying the signal. And you can see that it has uh, a low um, latitude component shown here, which maybe the model underestimates. It has high latitude components that indicate some sort of dynamical effect. And you can see that the model's capturing that to some extent as well. This is, this is the, um, the, the model's uh, re response to the Pinatubo volcanic aerosols. You can see, you can argue that maybe it's overestimating the warming uh, due to that relative to the empirical model, but nevertheless, um, there is some consistency and both the model and the empirical observations indicate that the anthropogenic greenhouse gases are cooling this layer. So again, as with the surface, once you combine the measurements and models at the surface with the measurements and models in the atmosphere, you, you begin to get a, a really good three-dimensional way of testing both the interpretation of the observation statistically and with the model. So going forward, I'm now going to talk um, in the last part of my talk about what this understanding means in terms of the future um, projections of surface climate. And this is to some extent the holy grail of why we're even trying to understand this, because we want to know what might be happening in the future, why it's happening and what it means. So this is um, based on a paper that we published in 2009. Uh, the concept is that we've been able to model and understand that things like the volcanic aerosols, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, greenhouse gases, and the solar irradiance together combine to influence surface temperature, which means that a simple way of forecasting the future is to try and forecast these predictors or these influences. Now, that's not so difficult with anthrop the anthropogenic influence in the sense that we expect it to keep increasing, at least according to the um, IPCC various scenarios. We can sort of expect that the solar activity cycle will continue to have an 11 year cycle, and that's shown here in green. We can't predict with any certainty the El Nino Southern Oscillation beyond maybe a year, and NOAA actually does that. And we really can't predict when there'll be a volcano. But you can see the comparison of the orange curve versus the dash curve. That's the difference in the future surface temperature depending on the occurrence of phasing of these natural influences superimposed on the anthropogenic influence. So for example, tracking the orange curve from 2014 to 2019, you can see that these patterns are fairly similar. 
This is just assuming greenhouse gases and solar activity. But once you um, consider an El Nino Southern Oscillation and a volcano, then these patterns become quite different. And this is really important for people who um, like, for example, those who, who, like, who need to detect the causes of climate change, uh, for, for example, like IPCC, and this is part of why there was a problem with the pause, these natural effects weren't taken into account. And so there was a misunderstanding about the multiple causes of climate change, the natural in addition to the anthropogenic. Going forward in time, Earth's surface temperature, of course, is expected to keep warming. And here is um, the empirical representation of the temperature in 2095 compared with uh, the GIS, David's GIS model simulation of the temperature for doubled CO2. One of the big things that you can notice here is that in the model, the North Atlantic doesn't warm as much as in the observations. Now, I just want to go back because I forgot to point out to you that in this pattern for the observations at of greenhouse gas responses, the statistical model, even for the period of observations, doesn't pull out cooling in the North Atlantic Oscillation as much as the model forcing, as the model suggests it. So you're already seeing this discrepancy between the model and the observations in the last three decades. So going forward, it's amplified. So the question is, what will happen to the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation? And David talked about this last month. This is an interesting problem because the, the model suggests that the warming increases freshwater input to the North Atlantic, decreases the strength of the overturning circulation, reduces the transport of warm water to high latitudes, and so the North Atlantic cools. The empirical it's very difficult, of course, it's even probably even um, improper to extrapolate a statistical model into the future. Nevertheless, this is, uh, this is such a thing. And it does show that maybe the warming, there's more warming in the Atlantic than the model suggests. I don't know the answer to that, but it's a really good question going forward to reconcile um, and better understand what's happening in the North Atlantic. Going forward, as you can see here, this is a solar cycle. So by the time we get out to the end of this century, it's clear, it's, it's only a very, very small, insignificant almost effect relative to the greenhouse gases. But nevertheless, the patterns are interesting and, and you can see that the discrepancies um, are there. Now, a question that I get asked a lot is, um, what happens if the sun goes into a morning minimum? So the morning minimum is a period from 1640 to 1715, where the sun's activity cycle essentially ceased. So it, whereas now we have a good, strong, or a decent sized 11 year cycle, back in the morning minimum, the cycle ceased, there weren't any sunspots on the disc. And so the solar people, uh, when they talk about morning minimum, imply that the irradiance from the sun is going to be decreased to um, below what it is now. And of course, then people ask, does that mean that we will have a little ice age? That's because there's an association in people's minds of the morning minimum and the coldest part of the little ice age. So Jason Seminar, who's at the um, Capital Weather Gang, writes for the Washington Post, um, talked to me about this and his article is very enlightening. And basically um, it says from his interview with me that no, a quiet sun will not cancel global warming by any means, and it will not cause a little ice age. And this is because of the following. If you take um, the model that includes the solar activity uh, projected forward, the sun's signal, the solar cycle, is only about a tenth of a degree at most. If the sun goes into a more minimum, our current understanding is that it will decrease by about the magnitude of the solar cycle. So that means it will probably over the next, over a few hundred years, increase the temperature by maybe a tenth, maybe at most two tenths of a degree. Because we've had so much greenhouse warming between the morning minimum or the little ice age. And now there's no way in our current understanding of solar irradiance that we will get back to 
more than minimum conditions? So the answer is a resounding no, a new more than minimum will not cancel global warming or cause another little ice age. The other thing that is interesting is that if you look at the carbon 14 record, which is a proxy of solar activity, you can see the more than minimum here as the most recent of a series of minima in solar activity. The minima come clustered in a 2400 year cycle. And this is the work of Kemmer Graken and Jörg Beer. We've just had one of those clusters. So if you believe, you know, damned, what is it? Damned lies in statistics. If you believe that, then we're not even expecting another Monde minimum for another 2400 years. So the answer to that is no, the sun is not going to save us from climate change. Now, another issue that is uh, interesting uh, and is perhaps a, a somewhat a discrepancy between the observations and the model, David's model, is um, the rate at which the ozone layer will recover. This is actually not David's model. This is the compendium of the dub, all the models in the World Meteorological Organization, which were chemistry climate models. If you look at the ozone, the global total ozone observations, which are in pink, the model shown in white, based on the merged ozone data version A, this says that in fact, ozone will recover perhaps more than w, w, WMO, World Meteorological Organization report said it was. Going forward, the ozone will recover partly because the ozone depleting substances like CFCs, which were regulated by the Montreal Protocol, will decrease. So that means ozone will increase, and that's this curve here. Those changes will be superimposed on a solar cycle of this magnitude in ozone. But in addition, the greenhouse gases are increasing and they are cooling the atmosphere, which increases ozone. And this is something that David reported on in 1998. So that's like 20 years ago. Um, ozone will increase because greenhouse gases cool the ozone layer, which increases chemical ozone production and warms the lower atmosphere. The question is what which is right, the models or the observations. Now, this, this issue is even more complicated because if you take another version of the ozone database, version 8.6, it actually implies that the ozone will never recover. So in this case, we have discrepancies between observations as well as between observations and models. But at issue here is something that the models can address, and that is how do greenhouse gases affect or accelerate the brew dobson circulation, which is the circulation of the middle atmosphere. And the, and, the, and the basis of this is that the greenhouse gas causes, gases cause surface warming, which accelerates the upward flow from tropical air into the stratosphere. And so this increases the, the wave driving and there's a shorter um, time for the transport of air from the troposphere to the stratosphere. So that means it's a decrease in the age of air. This is so this is, if you believe the way that the models um, translate the surface warming into, um, I'm not there yet, I'm not at the, <laughs> the conclusions yet, into um, the effect on ozone, then they would say that the age of air will decrease and um, because the Dobson, and the Dobson circulation will change. But the observations of the age of air suggest that maybe the age of air hasn't increased. Um, and there are also questions about model parameterizations of stratospheric wave drag, zonal winds, uh, wave breaking, etc. So this is another really topical area where the convergence of the, of the models and the observations um, can help us understand the processes. Um, so that's, um, that's the end of my talk. So in summary, um, I've talked about observations and understanding. We absolutely need stable long-term databases. I've showed you the surface temperature observations. I've showed you the temperature observations in the stratosphere, the ozone observations. The ozone observations in particular are probably not as stable as we would like, but all of them need to be kept going forward in time, as do the observations of the solar irradiance, the volcanic aerosols. So from the point of view of the observations, you can see distinct global, regional, seasonal response patterns, and the signatures are altitude dependent. In terms of the modeling and validation, um, since David and I began working on this problem with basically a climate model that didn't even have, I don't think, I mean, the stratosphere was like a sponge layer, I think, 
uh, the models have come a really long way and I think it's a good point now to start, we're at a good point to start comparing, really comparing um, the statistical um, patterns and the physical models. Up until now, most of the comparisons of the climate models have been done by matching global surface temperature. It's like, can the model reproduce the warming over the past hundred years? There's a lot more that we can do um, to, to try and um, validate the models and also the observations. In terms of projections of future global change, the concept that everything, the surface must warm because we have anthropogenic greenhouse gas increases um, is, some, is, is a complete misconception because due to the natural processes, there will be some warming, there will be some cooling over time scales, less than a decade, but on longer time scales, there will be warming. How will the um, Atlantic Meridian overturn circulation really change? I think that's a really fascinating question. And what about ozone? Depending on um, the interplay of the decreasing chlorofluorocarbons and increasing greenhouse gases, will we have a super recovery or will it never recover? We don't know the answers to that, but um, these, are, these are for the future. And in fact, you know, maybe we should not let David retire and he can come back and stay and answer all these questions. Thank you. So shall I stop share? Um, so we're gonna actually, what we're gonna do now, this is um, Danielle Manley talking. Um, I'm one of the co-editors on this book. Um, so what we're gonna do now is if you have a question, there's a chat feature in the, if you click on, uh, uh, if you scroll down to the bottom, you should see an option where you can um, type a question that you might have for Judith about her presentation. Um, and in the meantime, we're gonna turn it over to David for a, who, who will have a question uh, for Judith about her presentation to get the question started. Judith, thanks very much for this comprehensive. I, think I can't hear very much. Um, can, can you hear now? I can hear you, Danielle. I can't hear David very well. Ah, well, I will. I can to... hear you better. <laughs> okay, I moved closer. <laughs> I know, I'm sitting on my screen myself. <laughs> Thank you again so much for this comprehensive and very clear presentation for what happens on uh, global scales and even regional scales, differentiating the anthropogenic from natural forcing. Thank so you, David, for working with me on it. For working well, it was my pleasure. <laughs> uh, so the question I have is a little bit tangential, but I think you're the perfect person to ask it. A number of people over, over many years have talked about local influences, solar influences on weather and climate. And, and actually your statistical model shows that there are regional signals associated with the solar cycle variations and solar changes. Uh, at one point in time, very briefly, the uh, event, the the weather forecasting, the medium range weather forecasting center in the US used solar cycles for their estimates of what was going to happen in the coming winter, the so-called Lubitsky and Van Loon analysis they had done. What do you think is the reality and perhaps potential for using solar cycle to look at more weather associated regional patterns like storm tracks or Hadley cell variations, things of that nature that have sort of gotten succumbed under the general lack of respect that solar influences has, has been, have been given. Okay, well, firstly, David, you're more um, able to answer that than I, but I will have a go and you can um, um, drop in when I make a mistake. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going back to this image uh, where you can see that the solar signal Oh, the response of surface temperature to the solar signal has a pattern where there's warming at these mid latitudes, both northern and southern hemisphere. Now, people have associated, not me, but other people doing analysis like this, have associated this with the effect of the sun uh, manifesting at the interface of the Hadley and Ferrell cells. So the sense is... Um, what happens is as the sun's energy increases, it preferentially increases at low latitudes. And this alters the meridional 
thermal gradient from low to high latitudes. This is a more modest version of what people think or people are convinced or believe the greenhouse gases are doing, which is also changing the thermal gradient. But in this case, because of the Arctic warming more than the equator. And in the simulations that you did, uh, in one of the model uh, runs that we looked at, I believe that you said the solar activity weights the dice in terms of what is happening in terms of the dynamical circulation patterns that can affect weather. So the idea of the sun affecting weather directly is not, um, it just doesn't affect it directly. But what it may do in altering the thermal gradients, uh, it may modulate slightly the existing circulation patterns that um, already determine the climate. So for example, as the thermal gradient between the equator and poles change, uh, that affects the polar vortex, for example, which becomes more me meandering. And the idea of the association of storm tracks in, for example, this uh, region here in the North Atlantic, right, right at this interface here between the circulation cells, may be that um, we have more storm, we have a change in the storm tracks and colder uh, Northern Hemisphere winters in solar, in statistically, there are more of them in low solar activity conditions because of, of this um, changing thermal gradient. But um, the National Weather Service, interestingly, actually asked me to give a seminar next uh, in a few months on this very topic because they think it needs revisiting. So um, <laughs> your question is a little bit premature. I think at the time when they were, which is probably 20, 15, 20 years ago, when they were looking at the um, solar QBO effect. They were just looking at one particular aspect of it. I think, I believe also at that time, they didn't have models that necessarily properly included solar signals. Um, so going forward, I expect they might be a bit more interested in understanding this. On timescales at least of decades where I showed you that um, if, for example, you have a coincidence of El Nino and a cooling solar cycle, that could uh, mitigate things to some extent. But I don't know the answer to that. And you could probably add <laughs> more than I've said. Well, thank you. Uh, the only thing I will add is the one winter they tried it out happened to be a winter where a big El Nino developed, which overwhelmed all the other signals. So it wasn't a fair test. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Judith. Yeah. Um, a little bit about new directions or uh, directions of your work now. Um, could you uh, share what you're working on now and what you think are, are, are really fruitful, um, uh, fruitful directions to go uh, in the future? And I guess maybe just one, um, just add one comment, which is with the new IPCC report, about limiting the um, uh, in the warming to 1.5 degrees C above pre-industrial levels. That, if if indeed the countries of the world really really come really come together to reduce their greenhouse gases, all, all the other forcings become actually quite even more important. So uh, would 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 be. Uh, um, kind of get get back into a more prominent um, position. So what are your thoughts on, you know, wh what work are you doing now and really what directions do you think uh, need to be, would be most fruitfully followed? So, of course, there are many, um, <laughs> many answers to that question. In terms of understanding the effects of the sun on climate from a modeling perspective. I think that the direction that David actually started and that is continuing, uh, which is to develop fully integrated earth system models is really crucial so that you don't just have the stratosphere as a sort of um, sponge zone, you have a fully integrated stratosphere. And in fact, here at NRL and also um, elsewhere, I believe there's a tendency to even include to develop physical models that go up and include the thermosphere and ionosphere as well, so that you have a fully coupled system. I think that's really important. To do that, you need to have models that properly input 
the spectral irradiance variability, and there's this is not exactly my area of expertise, but my understanding is that the climate models currently use parameterized radiative schemes that maybe don't necessarily uh, incorporate the spectral variability properly. So one of the things that we're looking at and working with the AER people actually is getting a higher resolution, higher spectral resolution spe spectral irradiance variability model to fold into the um, radiative um, parameterizations for the climate models. Uh, another area that I think is really interesting is something I'm participating in with the UK Hadley Centre. It's called a, dec a decadal climate forecasting um, study. We don't have forecasts of climate even one year in advance operationally. So the Hadley Centre for the past six years has been chaperoning, if you will, or sort of organising inputs from all different climate models, including the statistical model that I talked to you, to you about, that I showed you, and going forward, um, the ability to predict climate a year in advance, two years in advance, that will need to have proper um, specifications of, of what the sun is doing. Um, at the moment, the statistical models that I showed you are based on limited data sets, and um, there is um, a, a, a coalescing of the solar signal and the greenhouse gas signal because when, when they both increase, there's a correlation one way or the other. Uh, that has to be improved. So that's for the current, current observations. The observations have to, I mean, longer observations are just going to be so crucial in better understanding these things. And then going back in time, um, there's... There's been um, growth in understanding of the causes of the solar irradiance changes from a solar point of view, but we still don't really, we can't model what will happen to the solar cycle in terms of the internal workings of the sun, which is the solar dynamo. Uh, we don't really understand why the dynamo comes and goes. Like we don't really know why the min more than minimum happened, but um, a better understanding of that, coupled with the fact that we are now getting really, really good high resolution um, cosmogenic isotope records of past solar activity, um, both in terms of carbon 14 and beryllium 10, will help, under, will help develop better models going back in time. And um, the PMIP 5 or PMIP 4, anyway, the next um, paleo simulations for IPCC will include simulations of irradiance that go back to the part, to the pre-industrial millennium. So understanding better the mechanisms of how the sun's irradiance changes on longer time scales uh, will help in that regard. So hopefully, I'd like to see all this coalesce, <laughs> but I think that's not going to happen for a while. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Judith. And thanks. I think those those new directions are very exciting. And for the students who are listening, you know, there's some great um, PhD topics, <laughs> right? Um, well, yeah. definitely. They can work on the Atlantic Meridional Overturn Circulation. Exactly. They yeah. can work on the age of air and the greenhouse. Yeah, there's so much to do, my goodness. Exactly. So thank you so much. <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.